talk about what this is and kind of how it works. Yeah, so the sliding hip screw, I mean, this is a revolution in the treatment of extracapsular hip fractures. Um, you know, whereas previously, uh, like there's even uh, Charnley, you know, the original orthopedic master, he had a hip fracture that was treated with um, a pin device uh, in England in the 19, gosh, I don't know, 40s or 50s. And it was the predecessor to sliding hip screw. So it's a great device. It's uh, relatively easy to apply. It's open, but not terribly maximally invasive, but it, it, it does exactly what you described. It allows that controlled collapse of the fracture. So ideally it's applied to stable fracture patterns that collapse back to a even more stable position. Uh, and because it allows that controlled collapse of the lag screw to the barrel, uh, it tolerates weight bearing. Nowadays, when compared to some more modern implants, the sliding hip screw is very cost effective and it provides what we think is pretty much equal outcomes in stable fracture patterns. Although there's a little bit of debate about that, about femoral neck shortening. Um, your diagram is great here. It shows a two hole sliding hip screw. Uh, with most people agree that you don't need a sliding hip screw with a bunch of holes with a longer side plate. We think two holes is fine in these more stable patterns. Uh, you can find varying angles, as you said, to fit whatever the anatomy of the patient is. Uh, and then I like uh, your second to last point. It touches on that idea of the tip apex distance. Uh, so that was a landmark paper uh, by a guy named Mike Baumgartner, who still, he still works and teaches at Yale, uh, where he studied a bunch of stable intertrope fractures treated with sliding hip screws. And the gist of what he came up with was well-placed lag screws that were deep and central in the femoral head uh, with that good tip apex distance of less than 25 millimeters hardly ever failed, whereas those with a very high tip apex distance failed more frequently. So even though some of the devices have changed over time, that's still one of the principles we live by in the treatment of these fractures uh, is that putting screws deep and central in the head on both AP and lateral views uh, is a good principle. And we think it maximizes our chances of a good result. Perfect. And that's in that apex distance, that the tip apex distance, just like you said, that's measured on the AP and the lateral. And is that a combination of, uh, of both on AP and lateral? Or I guess, how do you actually calculate that? Yeah, it's exactly like you described. You, you go to the center of the femoral head and you measure the distance to the center of the lag screw. You do that on the AP view and on the lateral view. And the ideal number is 25 or less. Okay. And for this construct, the, the screw itself actually can slide within the barrel, correct? That's what allows the controlled collapse. Yep, exactly. The lag screw, you see the big threads on it, they bite into the femoral head. Uh, stabilizing the proximal fragment. And then exactly as you said, that barrel has been, it allows the lag screw to slide within it. And so it allows controlled compression of the fracture, which we think is, is a healthy thing for the fracture that uh, loading it uh, stimulates healing. Yeah, and, and I know how, um, to me how extremely obvious that is right now, but I remember at least like halfway into, into uh, intern year, I was like, it's a lag screw. Like, I don't, I thought the lag screw stay in place. I didn't really understand the whole fact that it slid in and out of the barrel um, in order to help control that, um, in order to help with that control collapse. Yeah. So um, it's like a lot of things in orthopedics. Once you get your hand on the device and have a chance to mess around with it, it makes a lot more sense. 